Hey, welcome to Thought Seize Interviews, the show where we seize the thoughts of our guests while playing games of Magic the Gathering at the same time. Today, our first guest returns for our first uh, from our first episode for our first episode of our second season. Dijon is back with us on Thought Seize Interviews. Dijon. And uh, what is going down? <laughs> Uh, uh Dijon came yes. Dijon came with his own theme music. I'm gonna turn this light off. Was that Roadrunner? Roadrunner, Road Roadrunner. Road 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 Um, are you Jonathan Richmond guy? Um, yeah. Like you could say that. Okay. You know, like the uh uh the what's the one about the bus that he plays on uh david letterman the bus one i i only know it's the like, modern lovers ones yeah i don't know anything about any of it actually uh joni my fiance is is the she's the one but i like that one i saw the david letterman i, I watched that when i did Fallon. i wanted to see if it was good and it was we have so much to cover here. We have Fallon. We have you're engaged. There's so much that has happened since last time you were on our inaugural episode. Um, I'm so happy to be back. It's yeah. the only one I'll ever do. The only <laughs> talk I'll ever have. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. It's no Fallon. You know, we're not. It, it's no Fallon, but but. About? But we have here we have here a special a special Dijon specific magic deck here. If you can can you see it on your screen here? Oh, you know I'm looking at it. Okay, I see, great. I see. I see my legendary. Blood my legendary Thirsty rogue. Aerialist. All right, yeah, we yeah. put together this this little deck for you. Uh, so I want to hear from you in a sec about this card, Bloodthirsty Aerialist. This is like, this is your pet card. This is this is it for you. So. <laughs> My goal here was to build a deck around this card, which I, you know, it's not good. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, we put together a little mono black deck. Uh, we want cards that are going to gain life to put counters on here. It's got a mid range plan. Uh, you know, pretty standard. But, uh, you know, I wanted also to have my pet card. Mm. <laughs> In the deck, which is Obosh the Prey Piercer. So we, uh, and Lucas's pet card as well. It's mm -hmm. so all of the deck, mm -hmm. all the cards in our deck have to have odd casting cost. So there are one drops, three drops, seven drops, and then this X1. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe it's Come good, on, maybe man. it's bad. We're going to fire it up right now. We're gonna we're gonna play against randos on Magic the Gathering online. We're gonna I'm... message them. Ask if they care about Dijon, etc. Um, Dijon, are you, are you a gamer? You you know I'm I. There's only I guess for the past eight years, outside of maybe a couple dabble dabble zones during the pandemic, I've only ever played the Souls Souls games. The really. Souls games. Yeah. And you're like, you're you're deep in Elden Ring right now. I'm trying to be, but you know, like everybody seemingly is like beating it in New Game Plus. 10 times over and <clears throat> I looked at my thing I think I've played 36 hours so far that's pretty good it's that's pretty a decent. lot it's okay I've, 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 I know some people have hit like the 100 mark you know are I mean? you worried that people are gonna like shame you about not having played enough Elden Ring or not being legit enough at Elden yeah. Ring yeah everybody I talk about or talk to even including this stranger that I met yesterday all of them were like yeah I've never like played you know a Souls game and I was like, oh, what's the vibe? And they're like, yeah, I'm like 120, you know, I'm, I'm level, you know, I'm, I'm, I put in like 80 hours. I'm like, I'm actually stuck in the game. So <laughs> I'm like, I've plateaued. So I think I'm only level 63. I feel stupid. Get your level up, man. Come on. Get your freaking level up. Wait, how do I do this? This is my, this is my, my piece, you know? Dijon's playing, right playing during the interview <laughs> No, I'm not. It's just there, just in case something happens. You know, connection wipes it out. You know, <laughs> the the reason the bloodthirsty aerialist is 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 my pet card is because when I was playing um, arena, 
I was really bad. And I realized that Magic the Gathering Arena, the online thingy. Yeah, I was really bad. And a good friend of mine would like always get like the physical cards and new decks. And I was like, man, I just don't understand how to synergize cards at all. I think I talked about this a while ago. Yeah. But for some reason with the uh, little vampire that does the lifelink, Mm -hmm. I just had, you know, I just kept doing that with my bloodthirsty aerialist and I kept winning really fast. So you got really far with with like a deck that he shouldn't <laughs> have gotten. Yeah, like you shouldn't have done as well with the Magic the Gathering deck that you had. And um, I was, um, oh yeah. And then the moment it got kind of phased out, I was like, yeah, I'm done. I can't. I don't know how to work any cards anymore. Um, I mean, I get no it. rats. I wanted a rat deck. No <laughs> rats. I wanted a big worm deck. <laughs> Yeah, you wanted like the most obscure possible <laughs> yeah. tribes. Yeah. I was a poser with this, but you know what? I had a great time. My, um, my... We've just played a bloodthirsty aerialist, Dijon. Boy, do you, do you think <laughs> that I'm, do you think that I'm not peeping this? <laughs> um, D, you have so much you need to catch us up on. I mean, last time we talked, last time we saw you, you were working on this album. Cole and I came over to your house. There was like. You know, someone asleep on your couch. There was, you know, just shit everywhere. There was probably like a song that you were working on looping in the background. You know, you had this sort of chaotic, collaborative energy going on last time we saw you. Um, can you um, tell us a little bit about how things kind of got kicked off? I know you've been talking a, uh, talking a lot about this album lately, but... Um, you know, Cole and I got a little bit of a, uh, we got to see a little bit behind the curtain while you were making this record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and everything I've spoken about the record <clears throat> leading up to this has been a lie. I actually didn't make good. it. It's finally, and... <laughs> finally, the truth can come out on Thoughtseize interviews. Yeah, I actually didn't make the record and it's actually not out. And it's one of my, my bigger tricks that I've pulled. <laughs> Um, it's such a cool trick because I swear to God, I, I listened to it <laughs> and no, it's I like, watched you literally performing it. That's crazy. It took yeah. so much to make this, this trick happen. <laughs> it's one of the better tricks I've done. Um, no, it was just like, yeah, I think like when, when, you know, when you all came through and it was just, what, when was that? Like peak, maybe a year into the pandemic? Yeah. Um, and I think at that time it was like, you know, a little bit within within little circles and stuff like that. It was kind of like, I guess we can hang out now. And I think that the, mm-hmm. that's what sort of spurred it, really. And it was just, um, I'd made an EP before and, you know, you want to get stuff out or whatever, especially when you're kind of like confused as to, oh, am I going to tour, all these things. But I remember being like, okay, I think that was like a cool little palate cleanser. And then once we were able to see people, at least in this, like, very, I think everybody was still very cautious. Um, It ended up just kind of, like, snowballing into one person would bring, like, another person, because it was seemingly like everybody was relieved just to do something. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I try to think back, because I don't really often remember when I make stuff. I'm sure you guys feel the same way, or maybe you don't, maybe it's the opposite for you guys. But... You mean you yeah. don't remember the process? It's like one of those things where it just suddenly was like, okay, a consistent rotating cast of people were free. And they were just yeah. like, yeah, sure. You know, Mike um, McGee, you know, everybody kind of ended up living pretty centrally. And it would just be like, all right, Tuesday, what are you doing? Oh, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Just slide over at any time, any time in the day, which is, um, you know, was pretty crazy and, and definitely encouraged a couple of, pretty gnarly habits, I think, just like staying up till six or seven um, and just making a lot of noise. And seemingly nobody in the neighborhood cared because it was like, whatever, there's fireworks popping off all the time. It was like living in like a, like a pretty, what do you call that? I don't know. It was like living in like a weird chaos zone like for a while, which I think really helped and encouraged the record. And um, all I remember really is uh, when we did Big Mike's um, 
there was this sort of eureka moment between uh, McGee and I, which was just like, oh, this is what it is, you know, and and not a lot of the the end result <clears throat> sounded the same, but that's like why we kept Big Mike's and Rodeo Clown with that fidelity and that sort of um, those performances because those were the first ones that were done. And I think by the time, you know, you guys had stopped in to, to um, you know, to, to work on some stuff and say what's up. It was maybe, maybe like maybe a month or a month and a half of that energy being like, that. okay, this is the driving force now, which is just everything is out of the window. The, the mic's right there, it's looping, and it's just loud, and it's just whatever happens, happens. And that happened as like, that came up as a complete accident, which is just, yeah, I, I don't know. I just remember I did a version of Big Mike's because I, I kind of freestyled it, and I did a version of it that was like very gentle at first. And I think it was Mike who was like, nah, nah. And it was like, okay, well, back to the drawing board. And I think, you know, me having a horrible, horrible grasp on engineering, it was like, okay, well, what if you just turn up the preamp or something and then, you know, keep the music going in the background? Um, honestly, less thought out than that. But it was like, that was the next impulse. It was like, well, what's the next thing to do? And um, that became the guiding light for the record in its entirety. In, in its entirety, it's as much as I've talked about it in terms of like concept. It's actually that's actually the big lie is that there's no concept. <laughs> the, the guiding light was like, all right, this is the only fun time um, that we've had so far. And I think we just kept trying to repeat that chaos for a while um, until the latter half of the record, which was I kind of hit a wall, I think, and we drove to New York upstate new york and same you know same same group of people um came through and there was like a little bit more refinement in terms of how to do it but yeah it, that was it i don't know this daylight savings things has, re has really fucked me up so just so you guys know no I was playing I mean, <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly it was like 4 a.m elden ring hangover <clears throat> um no i uh yeah, coming over, there was like, you know, this sort of chaotic energy, a lot of like, I feel like what you tried to recreate in the um, the live videos is really what it felt like. Um, and um, but I remember you guys, you showed us big mics, and then you were working on some like really crazy one that I remember very well with like a wild bass line that Mike wrote. Yeah. And then you were kind of you, you had that one and then a, a two parts that didn't work at all together. And I was like, yes. well, maybe we were like kind of trying to figure out how to how they would work together, maybe. And then Mike was like, nah, they're not even going to go together. And we're, he had this attitude of like, we're probably not even going to use this, but it doesn't matter. This is just like all part of yeah. the chaos of the energy of the record, you know? The yeah. Sort of yeah, there were a few moments, <clears throat> you know, from some close friends and I totally uh, understood it. But. I think that, you know, and then it, it ended up, uh, it was, it was, you know, Jack Karaszewski who, um, who directed the sort of video thing that we put out and who actually understood and, uh, he kind of knew how to visualize and sort of also make it kind of cheeky, that, that, that chaotic process. But there were moments initially where it was like, that actually were very helpful for me, where like when you came through and I think we were doing this thing called dirty mind or maybe is what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, there were a few moments where it was like, Oh yeah, I think that this is completely directionless. And I think that that like, um, cause Jack ended up having a little spot out in upstate New York. So he came and did a few songs, um, a couple months later. But I think that that was, there was also this like, secondary eureka moment of like yes it's completely chaos and like you said yes it's like you know this is just part of the the rhythm but i think having a couple of those conversations ended up pushing the philosophy into being like okay the, the chaos part works but then like actually put on like a director's hat at some point in time right because i'll i'll never finish this and like management and stuff was like yeah just like finish <laughs> finish the record because I would, I would for the first time ever um with my manager, I would just, I was suddenly sending demos all the time. Yeah. And like, you know, sometimes there were two minutes, sometimes there were eight or nine minutes of just pure, um, 
just like room noise as mm -hmm. like a loop is happening. And after some of these conversations about like, yeah, this is chaotic and potentially directionless, that was when it was like, okay, um, take the elements like that because it's fun to just make crazy noise all the time. And it, you start to feel productive. But then um, that was the first time I was like, okay, let's look at, look at it top down. So when I drove to upstate New York, I was taking <clears throat> a lot of these like voice memos and demos that I was doing and just trying to see if there was anything good in it. And stuff like, uh, like the dirty mind thing that I think you were, you came and were um, helping us on. It was just like, okay, if this doesn't, like when we land in upstate New York at some point, um, if this doesn't like manifest into a song, or if I can't like figure out a justification um, for its, you know, things, um, then it just doesn't happen. And that was the first time, like, it, does, it doesn't land on the record. And that was the first time I thought about the, the pieces of noise and chaos, which ended mm -hmm. up uh, the one that we, that, that we were doing that didn't make it actually ends up being at the end of end of record, which is the, mm -hmm. hey, dancing like in 94. Yeah. Um, but that came from these, like, sort of realizations, like, okay, yeah, this will just never end, which is awesome. I kind of never wanted it to end. It was like a big circus. But right. Uh, but yeah. what you ended up with was so clean and cohesive and this like smooth, easy listen through just this fucking chaos lightning in the bottle situation, you know, yeah. which is like, how did you get to a point where you started ironing out things and finding things and, and like finding moments where there are several moments on the record where one song perfectly bleeds into the next is that were the, were they were they written that way? Did you end up realizing that they just <clears throat> happened to sequence really well later on? I think that the true, well, also, how are you doing? Cool. What's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> All right, real quick. We, uh, okay, we're playing against one of my most hated decks called Hammer Time. Uh, oh, we talking about garbles, uh, garbles we lost offer? Bad the first time, and we're actually doing okay. We, you know, we stuck a bloodthirsty aerialist. Uh, it, it, you know, we're doing good. What is delve? It just says delve. Delve means that you can, instead of paying the casting cost here, this would normally cost seven mana. Mm. You can exile six cards from your graveyard to help pay for the casting cost. As one should. So it makes it um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> the okay, but to go to... says, "I'm glad y'all doing these again." I recently watched all of them on YouTube. Show is sick. Thanks, Bread Pill. Bread Pill. Bye. That's giant. Bry Champ is in chat. And then Sourdough Marshall. Um, you like sa that? Sourdough Marshall. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what I was... Uh, what, what, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. The real truth of how some of the cohesion... It's two parts. Jack really helped. Because, um, you know, with the philosophy of, like, I'm going to record everything... Uh, alone, you know, we'll do, you know, we'll just do it. Like, I play clarinet all over the record as, like, a, I don't want to ask somebody to do those things. Cause oh, wait, you act, you ended up playing clarinet on the record? Yeah. I did, like, a, I did like a pretty drunken solo. I, I remember when you were, you were like, dude, I can play this, like, but you did hell of could not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On Noah's highlight reel, there's like a little funny, like, fake Randy Newman. Vibe. and um I mean, but if it was Woody it, Allen can do it shit <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ <laughs> um no but so it was like okay well Jack was like look uh how about I just help you mix this record and instead Jack of Jack Karaszewski yeah Jack Karaszewski the director of the video and uh tall human and mm -hmm. I was like okay yeah and during that that you know that was a huge part of it in terms of how to sequence it um and I realized that I'd never done like a bird's eye thing on a record before. I've never made a record before. So mm -hmm. that was a huge help. But the real juice was also Mike and I have the tendency to play in the same key. Like we always play in, I think like A flat or something. And then, you know, the couple pitch downs if, if, if it feels right. But I think that helped with a lot of the songs. Absolutely. Accidentally being like yeah, every song is in this key. Too. Yeah. A um, good key to try, just a suggestion, a uh, really good one is C, because it doesn't have mm -hmm. any uh, of the black keys, which are hard, harder to play. So difficult, but like, yeah. 
It's so rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it, that was interesting too. Also, Andrew Sarlo was a big help in terms of like shutting off, uh, shutting off the process and kind of. Um, I think Andrew Sarlo did the, the first pass at like arranging the record and. Mm. Um, it gave me a few ideas of like, okay, that worked or what I didn't want, you know what I mean? And it ended up being almost chronological, I'd say, like mm. of the record sort of, um, that's just actually, I just lied. I just lied on a live stream. It actually just wasn't chronological at all. But but I know what you mean. It starts with yeah. big mics and then kind of, yeah, and then kind of evolve from there. Yeah, because after Upstate, um, I did many times with Andrew Sarlo and Mike McGee and um, The Dress. And I did those, that was the last stuff that I tried to make. And I tried to make, I think for like two more months, I tried to make more music and I just couldn't. And it felt like there was, you know, you go back and you're like, yeah, I could probably have done certain things differently. But as a first record, my brain was like, all right, you're, I think you're done. I tried so hard. I have so many um, less interesting songs that I thought I, I had to squeeze in. I'm glad I didn't, but you know that was helpful when other people were like, nah, it doesn't really work. Um, also, the first time I'd made music where people around me were like, you know, when you're first starting out, everybody's like a champion. This is the first time I'd made stuff that people were like, that doesn't work at all. Um, mm. I think End of Record was originally like nine minutes, and um Noah's highlight reel was also nine minutes, I think. And people just be like, nah. And yeah, it, I mean, everything's so succinct, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything is so quick, picking where you just like seemingly arbitrarily end some of them, you know. Yeah. It's even, even credits, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, that one was a special. I wish that every song on there was exactly just that song over and but, over. But they all have that energy to them, where it's like, yeah, it kind of start, kind of starts, kind of ends when I feel like it's gonna end. Yeah, I was really obsessed with the idea too of like, I used to get criticized a lot for like short music, and so I did the opposite. I made long music, and I, and then went back to just realizing I think that I get criticized for long music. You're getting criticized for sh for having quick short songs. Yeah, it's like <laughs> always like, oh, this should be like, you know, if there was a second piece for like a a post chorus or something like that. And a lot of the record was me trying to undo songs. I just like, I'm so, you know, there's just songs in general, just so uninteresting to me. Longer music is interesting because it's, you know, you start to get, the lines get blurred a little bit, but I just get mm -hmm. so like, <clears throat> it's so unexcited by like, if I know where it's gonna, like, if I know the structure, I love pop music, but I have a hard time trying to make it because I get bored, you know? Um, Yo, should, also get lazy. We, should we pick up some of these questions from chat? I feel like there's some cool ones. Yeah, Bust that. Should we rapid, yeah. rapid fire through some of these? Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and I'll say yes. I'll say yes for sure. <laughs> right, we got, we got uh, Morky Man here. Mm. Morky Man 13. Uh, wait, that's not a question. Hold on. We got Jody Lee Oliver. How stoked are you about touring with Mr. Iver? Very stoked, very nervous. I think he's gonna kick our ass, and that's that's just, and that's just the facts, Jack. Hell yeah! It's one of those things where it's like I I used to be super excited about how like bizarre and like uh, uh, like minimal and and crazy our live show was with like the sort of weird pieces that we had, and now I'm kind of like, oh god, I mean, it's just gonna be he's just gonna spank our little butts, so. <laughs> All right, next question from, uh, who do we got? All right, all right. We've got... How Lobel. much this... What? Oh, Kate, Cabe Lons. Why'd you call it absolutely? Oh, because uh, everything I wanted to do on the record was absolutely perfect. No, um, yeah. No, I, I, we, we kept thinking of like titles and every album title... It was like the trying to trying to avoid the curse of like debut album, which was really freaking me out. And every title just felt like it couldn't possibly, um, it couldn't possibly represent how kind of like sometimes how how both like 
serious we took the record, but also how not serious most of the record was. And that was just a, a like a t- we had a bunch of I had a bunch of separate text threads where every text would just be like, "What if it's called, you know, the quest for Colonel's coins?" And it would be like. It would be stuff like that constantly, and then eventually it was just like, I guess we should call that. Quest, quest for Colonel's Coins is pretty strong. It's pretty honestly. insane. Yeah, no, um, don't steal that. That's mine. But, mine. but, but wait, uh, what's the curse of the first record? I, had, I developed this idea of the curse of all the records. And one, the curse was like, if you, I, I feel like I've always been a critic of music before I started making it. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm obsessed with music. And I would always create these weird notions where it was like, the debut album should be, you know, great, and it should be perfect. But if it's perfect, you know, started, I started creating these bizarre things where it was like, if it's perfect, is there room to grow, or will you always be like, you know, whatever? And then I always thought about like, well, great albums that were like amazing had great titles like Paul's Boutique and stuff like that. And it was just this bizarre gumbo of like confusing thought processes that I was trying to avoid. And so I was like, well, I don't want to take myself too seriously because I think that my music did that for a while. Um, I was also like in, in the event that some of the music isn't obviously funny, then maybe I can make it funny in this way. You know, it was, it was one of these things where I would analyze other records so deeply and either try to completely capture the spirit or completely avoid it. What's um, it mean to take yourself too seriously, musically speaking? And I, I think... It's so interesting because all my favorite music in the world is like deeply serious to a degree mm-hmm. or like deeply. For example. For example, you know, I've always been re- really into smog, which I think mm-hmm. is extremely funny and filled with, you know, filled with like cheeky stuff. But at the same time, it does. A lot of it comes off as extremely um, sober and, and, and realized. Mm-hmm. But I thought that. I, you know, um, I thought I couldn't wear that hat confidently, but at the same time, a lot of my music would default to extremely introspective or whatever, especially when I was alone. It would be like my tendencies would flip into extremely like meditative stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought that maybe, you know, when I was working on this record and I realized that I was kind of just freestyling off of other people playing for the first time and being able to direct it and guide it in that way, I found myself becoming a lot less um I, I was a lot less like forlorn when i was making the music so i was like well how do i maybe i don't have the acumen yet to write like you know eric Badu or john prime who can be extremely you know severe but also really funny i was like at least the performances are kind of characters and kind of goofy um and yeah so i just wanted to kind of get away from this immediate feeling of like this is extremely sober music that's like you know sometimes brooding um because i felt like one i can't really carry that that load as as, as well as other people can and also because most of the time i'm not that serious i'm only serious when i'm like you know playing elden ring <laughs> right <laughs> i mean when that I, there's that's that's, <laughs> that's that's life or death but the um it does look like especially that there's 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 in the live video a quality of you guys enjoying playing mm-hmm. music together and like, it looks like you're having fun and you're not taking it too seriously but there's also these songs are can be pretty devastating and pretty pretty heavy at the same time and pretty deeply personal um, yeah it's the fast card thing i wanted to do like uh, that's always been like a litmus test that I've, i think i've consistently failed to Achieve, but it's the fast car vibe, right? You want to make something that's like accessible, or at least it feels familiar in some way, but it has some sort of weight, I guess, somewhere. But I wanted that to be implied rather than I, I would often like smear it, you know, probably due to a lack of skill or something. But I would often like that would be the flag, that would be the only piece of the meal that you could, that'd be the only flavor in the meal that you can identify is like that emotion. And I just wanted to see if I can. You know, if I can twist that, because you know, I realized that a lot of the stuff that inspired me to make the, the record, you know, there's some serious elements, but there's a lot of joy or a lot mm-hmm. of like looseness. And it was the first time I, I was just very aware of that. And yeah. 
When we, uh, there's a bunch of questions in chat that we are going to okay. get to. I think we should, Please. we should get, we'll get to them to, I think at the end, because <clears throat> we just have a couple more here and there's so many in here. So we will, we will get to these, but, um, I'm also I, long winded. So no, which is, that's exactly what we want. I think, um, when I, speaking of, you know, your inspiration for the record, when we hung out, you, I feel like you had just discovered the band. Uh, mm -hmm. talking, we're talking about, you know, Levon Helm, the band, the band, Robbie Robertson. Um, and I feel like you're someone and correct me if I'm wrong or if this doesn't resonate with you, but you're someone I have a couple friends like this where they sort of missed some of these like classic must listen to records or that some might perceive as classic must listen to records. And you've come to them kind of late and you have this fresh perspective on things that people are like, yeah, the band, like what? Yeah, we all know the weight, you know? And yeah. and it gives you someone like you this whole new, you know, you're you're just like revitalized by these things that everyone else has taken for granted. And you take it and you put this completely new, fresh take on this sort of Americana approach. Does that resonate with you at all? Well, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, thank you. Um, but, but it's also, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. Like I grew up mostly on like hip hop and R and B and, um, when I got into like, you know, friends would give me CDs or like burn me CDs or, you know, all that stuff. And I started touring. There's just so much music. And then, you know, I would do stuff like, you know, going deep, like, you know, Rolling Stone or, or like Wikipedia dives, but you just inevitably miss stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, also, when you see like certain associations, I think when I was younger, I, was, I had a hard time really jiving with like Bob Dylan at first. So I kind of missed an entire era. And yeah, when I heard stuff like the band, I think what it did too is also it just sort of humbles you and excites you because you start to realize that some of the ideas that you were like developing, um, which specifically were just like, what's it like to like make music in kind of a dusty environment? You realize a lot of these ideas have been done. Mm -hmm. And um, I just didn't have a lot of time or interest in like with some of the music that I think that people were, you know, exposed to at, at different phases. I didn't have the time to like analyze like what the drum sound was or like, you know, how the, like if you ask me anything about like what I imagine like Pharrell's techniques are or like Timbaland's techniques are from the back in the day, I could probably obsessively gush about it. But when it comes down to like me hearing, you know, the weight for the first time, I have no context to be like, this board was used. I didn't know that there was like, oh, they, they went to a place in upstate and um, recorded by themselves and stuff like that. I didn't know that. And that's, a, that's the mythology of the band. So I was able to hear that stuff and be like, well, the songs rip, but also the, the feeling of it rips pretty hard. And I just, you don't have any time to like overthink it or an, overanalyze it. I think that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of like me recently discovering like Bruce Hornsby on the record. And instead of, picking apart stuff like I have the tendency to do, I was just like, oh, what's that feeling that I like mm -hmm. in the Bruce Wentley thing? I, I didn't sit with it as long as many other people have. So um, I'm it's constantly- It's free of context for you yeah. in some ways. I'm also a thief is what I, is what is- We all are. Yeah. So yeah, I just got excited about something. And it, you, you were right though. It's the first time ever um, a lot of homies are like, of all the bands you don't know, you don't know the band. Right. That's insane. Really right. Insane. No, but I, I think that that's a, that's a sort of special gift where <clears throat> you you get to hear these things that are taken for granted that are sort of songs that have just been in the air for a lot of people. And you get to see what's so special about them because they are special and everyone's sort of taken this thing for granted. And you, you know, what's interesting, too, is like they become parts of like people's understanding in like, in their lexicon of, of music history. Mm -hmm. But it's not for me. So then. Right. When I hear it, you know, outside, like, you know, barring like actually taking, you know, riffs and, and chords and stuff like that, I'm hearing it relative to like me just listening to Babyface Ray. So, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, I'm hearing it in, in a new context that doesn't, it's never informed my songwriting, like literally, in the same way that if you grew up on it, you might, if you grew up on like Zeppelin or something, um, your understanding of the history of music has like little checkpoints and mm -hmm. Zeppelin is one of them. For me, I heard like the way, specifically what I heard was 
I shall be released. And that's when I was like, I've never heard anything like this now. But for some people, that might be the, the guiding light for all their music they made. Um, and I think it just makes it easier for me to like, you know, think about it in a pretty loose and, and you know, I, I won't say like fresh because I can't say that about my own music, but that just allows it because I have no frame for mm -hmm. where it's supposed to sit, the songwriting. To me, that sounded like new songwriting. It sounded like yeah. everything I was looking for in, in songwriting. It didn't have like any hallmarks of what I understood like the 60s and 70s to be. It felt very radical because I'd, I'd never heard it. So um, then people immediately identified <laughs> that I was listening to the band. So Yeah. Your um your record has this loose lo-fi quality to it that everyone loves and appreciates. What is it? Is that a scratch scratcher? What is that? It's a this <laughs> is a patch card, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the same your record Von Helm used. <laughs> yeah, this is from his, his yeah. house. Um, your album has this loose lo-fi quality to it. Um, and um. It's definitely, there's, you know, it's cool to see this sort of raw kind of music make it into, you know, playing on Fallon. It's pretty sick. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, given every resource at your disposal, given whatever budget you could want, whatever studio, whatever collaboration you could have, how would that change you know the 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 project for you you're not making things out of your home studio anymore is, does that interest you having this like crazy budget doors as doors start to open and as things start to change are there sort of dreams and ambitions to do things where maybe it would how how would it how would that affect the the sonics of the project if 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 you had carte blanche to do whatever you want and and everyone was giving you whatever you asked for yeah, I mean, I think going forward, I can't leave like any stone unturned in that way. And I have to try <clears throat> to see if like, mostly it, it's all mostly for like, it's it's for the spirit of it, right? So it's like, if the freshest thing or the most inspiring thing is being uncomfortable in a studio environment, then that's what I have to try to do. Um, I think leading up to this, I was just, I'm just kind of a control freak when it comes to ideas or how I've, I want them to sound. And that's the, that's what informed it. Because I think that there's been opportunities where it's like, I could get people to help engineer or, or things like that. And I just always took, turn it down because I didn't feel like my voice was, was realized yet. And I think that, um, while I still don't think it is, yeah, I, I think that I would try, but I don't know, it, it's not my first impulse. I'm also banned from every studio in LA because I don't flush, so. Um, <laughs> but, See no, I mean, better, man. Come on. <laughs> It freaks me out a little bit just because, of course, I mean, I don't believe in any, any, um, like, rigid rule set. But at the same time, you know, I have the tendency to fear that there's a sterility that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm often proven wrong. Um, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much consistently proven wrong, actually. I think that... Um, but I just haven't found myself confidently in that space. I haven't seen the, the, the vision of it yet. Um, but so I think, yeah. You're happy to maintain this, this sort of way that you've been working and, I and think, you don't need to go to Capitol Records and record in a big ass studio or, you know, get a, a thousand didgeridoos or whatever the, the I mean, is. I think that until I'm like, like, you know, with, with, with your record, for example, I, I just, I can't fathom you having the confidence to be able to guide it in that way. And like, I haven't had that. I haven't found that confidence yet. I can find it within my room and like with fresh friends because it feels like the stakes are lower. And I think I'm still like, um, I, still, I still often struggle with that. I think it's, it's more of a personal thing right now than it is like some overarching sonic uh, manifesto. At the same time, um, I, yeah, I, I've just never been present in a studio situation um, where 
I've heard it immediately be like, this is something I want to listen to or something I, 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 I identify with. Like I've done sessions and um, there's something about like the uniformity of how every vocal take sounds. It, it just, that sort of bothers me because it, it, it's not how I hear music. I hear mm -hmm. it like every piece, like everything that you try to work on as a standalone piece of music, always. Mm -hmm. that, that's how I hear it. And so recording in like an unstable environment helps that. And maybe is a crutch, um, but yeah. I, but at the same time, I feel like with the next record, I have to try everything, um, mm. even if it's just for the jokes. Even if there's just like one moment where it's the most hi-fi. Right. So, um, but I guess my question isn't like, do you want to go more hi-fi? Do you want do you want to sure. go to Capitol Records? Do you want to go to a fancy studio? My question is, is there something that you couldn't do before that now the doors open and this is is there something you want access to and maybe it seems like now you have a lot more eyes on the project where you still had bunch up before, but it, uh, is there something like, like for me having a choir is a dream and I just, it's, I can't, I can't do it cause yeah. it's just, it's just too difficult to, to, to accomplish and not ultimately worth necessarily. So like, is there something like that, some sort of dream or, or something that you haven't been able to do that now the doors are open for yeah. it? The answer no is totally appropriate. Yeah, also. <laughs> I, would say, I would say right now no. I yeah. would say that um, I, I, I'm I'm obsessed with like you know limitations. I, I there's nothing that I don't think that I could figure out or like friends could figure out. You know, limitations and chaos. I mean, the collaboration. Yeah. You know, you talk a lot about the collaboration on the record, and I know there was a lot of camaraderie and and people coming in who you love helping with the project, but. I mean, is collaboration always this sort of um, net positive? I mean, t talk about some of the. Str I know, I know that it can get messy, and when yes. you're when you're and and that there's this sort of you're talking about this this having this chaos around you and sort of bottling that. Um, is that do you feel that that's necessary to your process now? Some of this sort of ugliness. I think that like. You know, no, I, I think that it, it ended up being like, um, I think it ended up being maybe a pretty heavy toll, I think, mm -hmm. on like friendships and personalities, even in, um, even in like a, just like a temporary space, because it's actually been a little bit of time since I made it. And I think some things are being solved, but I think that there's a lot of tension that ended up developing naturally. Um, and for me, there was a lot of like, kind of anger also so it was simultaneously extremely fun and extremely frustrating um after a while um there were certain things that I, I i learned which is like you know somebody like like uh you start to learn who you can really lean on and in what ways and i think that um the record could not be possible without some of that really intense oscillation of emotion it also couldn't be possible you know without like with Mike without Mike um and I learned a lot about that I learned a lot about like what I'm good at but I don't know if it needs to be that out of control I think that also the context of the pandemic helped it become that out of control I don't yeah. think I could sustain the energy anymore um it was also just like a bit unhealthy it was like no sleep right. kind of stuff and I'm a little bit out of that zone I think um but there was a part of it where it felt kind of method Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a kind of detrimental. I started to realize that, you know, even that's kind of exciting. It's not that exciting. Like, right. nobody nobody can tell the difference. So, um, yeah, I want the next record to be somehow more collaborative, mm -hmm. but much less, uh, much less, um, you know, yeah, much much less chaotic. I think it's not sustainable. Also, like you know, I wanted to, I want to explore asking. <clears throat> certain people for certain things on like the next record. And I don't, and I don't think that the environment that, you know, you guys witnessed is the most uh, conducive for everybody, especially if the relationships aren't as intimate, if there's not friendships there, you know? So, um, yeah, that's yeah something I I'm really like curious about and thinking a lot about is like, I guess for you, like what's your process for making decisions like while collaborating? There's all these mm -hmm. people with ideas, maybe they're good. There's like, 
you know, some kind of pride over this is my idea or whatever? How do you end up making a decision? Um, a lot of it would be completely, um, I, I'm like a, a level 12 uh, scholar of demoitis vibe. So it would sometimes it would just be the first idea. <laughs> if that helped like inform a melodic choice or it helped inform like a cadence or a rhythm, I just couldn't not have it in. Um, there's so much of the stuff that was like a little bit stitched around on the record, but most of like the playing, especially like a, the really out playing was part of like, like a loop that was just maybe the first thing I recorded that maybe somebody else did. And then I felt like, a, you know, I felt a spark or something into the melody or did a, you know, got the final lyric out or something, and I couldn't take it out. It just felt like it was, there were a couple of those decisions where, you know, friends helped, um, or something really stuck out. But for the most part, it was just like, if it was just there, um, I didn't do a lot of doctoring in terms of, I didn't do a lot of editing. Um, the only thing that I would always do is if, if it encouraged a melody or encouraged the thing and didn't take up too much space, I would keep it, I would just keep whatever. Um, yeah, you kind of just did, but can you just describe what demo-itis is to the, oh, yeah. the viewers? Well, it's just if I, you know, it's, it's, if you hear the first pass of like a, a thing you bounce, you're obsessed with it and you don't want to change it. Um, and most of this record was like demo. <laughs> first demo. <laughs> so is it good or bad for artists to listen to their own demos? Perfect. I don't think that anybody should ever adhere to any rule about anything ever. It's the perfect thing for everybody i think that's the rule that's a good I, answer yeah i don't think that there well, I, I just i don't think there should be I, i'm also just super anti anything making sense now you know i made so much music that i think was too logical for a long time so mm. um what does that mean it was just so clearly thought about in some mm. way um which i think was a detriment why um, just because I think for me, it's kind of similar to what I was saying before. I don't think I can sustain that sort of pressure of like, I, I don't think I hold, I don't think I, it, I don't think I wear it well. Like this, mm. like a very, um, you know, calculated or like serious person. I think that I, I, I'm, I'm a, a little more suited to this like court jester of a musician vibe. Um, lowers the stakes for me too. Yeah. <laughs> I can just do whatever. Um. But yeah, I mean, there were a couple moments where I don't think any, actually, I think that's a lie. I don't think that there's any moment on the record where I asked somebody to play something specifically. I, I definitely don't work like that. But there are, and there were only a few moments where the fifth thing that somebody played in a loop or something was better than the first thing to me. Right, right. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, there's a couple times I muted stuff. And that was pretty much it. My decisions were pretty based off like, also, I think it helped how I recorded it a lot of the time. So you could play, a friend could just slosh around and lap steel and it didn't take up that much frequency space because I just had the mic so far away. So yeah. it just kind of, kind of sat there. I learned a few tricks for myself. You can uh, have them. <laughs> um, you posted recently about the lyrics being wrong. Mm. on on platforms and you also mentioned that you had to re-download instagram to post about this right now can you talk about um can you set the record straight where can you get correct lyrics a if anywhere i think from <clears throat> from deep within the mind's eye okay All right. I'd, uh, I'd, 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 oh no i actually it's just insane i i, I submitted the lyrics to huh. the manager um uh -huh. I don't know how it got lost in the, in the sauce. I think that maybe there's like a third party that does it. Um, I guess we're going to do vinyl, so that the lyrics will be on there, so everybody can everybody can can crack open your books. Amazing. Those know? are both questions from chat. Are there going to be vinyl and uh, yeah? And uh, should I questions about the lyrics? Should I reveal the vibe, which is the best kept secret in the game, which is that like it takes a long time to do vinyl, and I missed the cutoff. Yeah, like, I missed it so hard because we're supposed to do like separate masters for the vinyl. I just completely botched that. I wasn't sending because I didn't. A lot of the record I didn't have much like, you know, we did um, Jack and I mixed the record almost in its entirely entirety, and it would just be like us two trying to get the. Yeah, I think he had most of the final mixes, 
And it was just, we kept, I kept forgetting to ask him. And then it would be like two weeks until we sent a batch of them. And it was like, dude, we missed this so bad. And like no distributors or vinyl were could do it in quick turnover. So what the fuck is Jack's problem? I mean, how does he? I don't understand how he he's mixing records now too. But this like, is our philosophy. This is what I'm saying. You know, is that it, we should all it, just do it. Just do it yourself. Yeah, and if he got if he has a clearer understanding of like, you know, where a bass hit, you know, can sit in like a frequency spectrum, and I don't have that understanding, it's like, well, then you should just do it. Cause it was really just like that. It was like he was present for a couple of the songs, so yeah. he under he understood the the um, the energy, and he was the only one who confidently was like, "Fuck it, I'll do it. I don't care." That was yeah. his attitude. His shoulder shrug was like, "I just don't care." <laughs> he was like, "I'll just right. do it how I think it should sound." He's obviously got the ears, and you guys have worked together for a long time. It's like ultimately what matters. Yeah. Um, I guess I just didn't want the shit to sound like. I just didn't want the. I, it's it's totally um, a pre-assumption, but I also just didn't want the burden of having to explain to somebody who wasn't a part of it how to mm-hmm. do it. I actually mm-hmm. think that Mike and I, like McGee, I think he might have done the first pass of the mix of Big Mike's, the one that's on there. I think it might have just been him. I think okay. He like just came to the computer and was just like, you got a um, cat in the background? Oh my goodness. You want to see Grim? Yeah. Yeah, we have chat is asking about the, about the cat. Check this little fool out. He was given to us. I heard actually, about by a couple that was moving. Yeah, I heard about about this story. His name is Grimbaldi. Um, oh, boy, some someone spamming how to pronounce your name: Dijon or Dijon? Uh, both. My mom says it Dijon. My dad says Dijon. Okay, there you go. Um, someone also asked what your favorite new school rapper is. Oh, uh, um, or if you I have like, favorites, I like them all. Like every single one that's ever rapped. Okay. That's uh, good. No, I like uh, who's new school. Oh, I like Boldy James. He's new. Kind um, of. Boldy James is the best, bro. Okay. okay, that's a good answer. Um, is there is there anything you want to anything else similar to the lyric situation that you want to set the record straight on that's that's been gotten wrong? Is there anything that's been misconstrued as as the rollout of absolutely reaches the masses? Yeah, it's not that you know, it's not that deep. It's not that serious. Like it's all, a, it's all a laugh. That's the whole thing. Also, nobody thought I'm, that I call bullshit on that man. <laughs> but on. like nobody thought that credits was funny. Nobody like it's just me saying we're out here freaking the vibe. I thought that was so funny. I'm just not, not that funny. I think. I think that like my, but you know, I know. I think that there should be some levity when you listen to the record. I think that, um, it's specifically a record about having fun especially when things aren't that fun. Even if it's like, you know, your relationship or something. It's just a record about like little small chunks of nuggets. So I think there should be a little bit of joy. And also it's intended to ask a question of you if you listen to it, which is, do you like it? Mm-hmm. And you say, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, Nardwar would ask you, why should people care about Dijon? Mm. I think it's a really hard question. It's a super hard question. Um, well, I think maybe because it's, I mean, if you want to do it, if I, I just think that it's a, it's an interesting question. I think it's, it's a hard one. I, yeah. I care about music a lot. I think that I like it. And I think that, you know, if, if allowed to, which I have been so far, I've been very lucky. If you're if if I'm allowed to continue to like uh, explore it and get you know get you know get get my bearings a little bit more because you know I just started really releasing music um, like six years ago so it's like if if you're a fan of music um, there could be maybe a revelation here somewhere at some point in time because I care about it a lot care about it and I think about it a lot and I think that um yeah so that's why you should care about it because actually I care about it a lot and then maybe there will be a language that's made for you know for all at some point in time that's a good answer that's a great answer um 
Should I ask my big question? Oh yeah, Cole has Coley has a has a has a big one. Oof, lay it on me. Dijon. <clears throat> what is music? Mm. The the wind rustling through the trees, the scent of a pomegranate that just fell on a <laughs> on a stockroom floor. <laughs> um, uh, the whistle of a bird. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 that oh it's 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 yeah music is the it's the spirit i think is what it is i'm on this new this new style for anybody i'm it's the spirit that's what music is you believe in god no but do, do is there a god is there a dijon god style god that you believe in the spirit yeah the spirit yeah what does that mean to you um it is the the the, the well okay Oh, this is a good. I thought, see, this is cool because no one would ever want to ask this. But actually, I, okay, so I do believe in God, but not in the God that that we think it is. Mm-hmm. It's a big bowl of cherries. Um, <laughs> I, I believe in like a. Okay, like I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, no yeah, need to. I believe in like a. The. The ridiculousness of the whole thing, right? Of the whole situation that we're in all the time. That's probably the God, right? I think the... You believe in the God of chaos? Is that what you're telling me? No, but like, you know how there's like... I don't know. It's like... It's the all thing, right? I don't think that it has a anthropomorphic quality. And I don't think it would have... There's no. I don't know. I think it's just the thing that governs, which is all things. The whole system. The whole system at play. I guess it's the guy, but I do follow this this thing. The further I try to make music, which is just like there is an innate, uh, like how absurd and how cool is it that like I don't know ancestors heard thunder and stuff like that. I think in the same way that like a monkey preens another monkey, or like a dog chases a squirrel. That it's 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 our faculty. It's our like. Uh, it's our like coyote howl. Are you saying it's like a, hu- a human need to believe in in some sort of higher power? Well, it's just an absurd thing, right? Where like that's what the humans do. It's like you, mm-hmm. you emulate the, a thing, and you get sensations through the emulation and some sort of rush or some sort of response. That's the spirit, and I think that as music in a context and like a cultural context constantly shifts, there's always a fixed spirit somewhere for everybody. I think for every you know situation, every style of thing that connects you, it's like if you only grew up just in like baroque flows or something, and you were inspired to make that or things that are informed by that, you have like your own little egg, your own little spirit egg that exists for you. I think for me, there's a spirit, um, which is just the first time I got like a sensation that was exciting musically. That's the spirit. Everything is dictated by that. And you make a bunch of mistakes and you fail it. But that's the spirit. That's the God, in my opinion. I agree. I, I think everyone has has a has a need to worship something, whether they realize it or not. And mm-hmm. we all sort of make something a, a higher power or or whether whether we realize we're doing it or not. Um, yeah, the subconscious function like functions. Like if you like I'm, I have I gravitate towards certain certain things, certain like reactions or interactions in music. That's not dictated by, it's not dictated by, uh, you know, I think an all, like a being, but what it is dictated by is by like invisible circuitry. Mm-hmm. And that's an insane, cool thing. Like, you know, maybe it's like you're six years old and you get really excited. I, actually, this is exactly what it was for me. I was really young and I liked uh, uh, SWV, the song Week. Mm-hmm. And then she does the, the bridge. It's like, I try hard to fight it. No way can I deny it. And like, I didn't know what chords were. I still don't really know what chords are. But that interaction was like one of the first memories I have of being like a little kid and being like so super, I don't know, you, it's like your body flushes and it feels weird. Then you mm-hmm. go about your day. And like, it's insane that, that that's embedded in a circuitry forever now. That's just it. And so that's a beautiful thing. And so everybody has that version maybe of that. Maybe it's like a lyric. Maybe it's, you know, Tom Waits just going like, but like maybe that had that reaction for somebody and that informs their entire excitement or, and that's a cool, that muse is, is, is 
an interesting one and it's there to make people feel very powerful because and also humble because it's happening without you. Mm -hmm. you know, it's happening within you, but it's happening without you. And that, my friends, is what we call a take. <laughs> yeah, I, good answer. I think hit. that's we got to call it there. That's yeah, that's that's you know, that's uh, leaving on on a high Costanza style, uh, you know, Just, yeah, the summer of the summer of thoughtsies. <laughs> <laughs> um Dijon, is there anything else uh you would like the people to know before we uh we we get on out of here um no just like, you guys rule and you two rule and the bloodthirsty area list is the the visual the visualization of the muse cole do you want to break the news to him it wasn't good. Uh, Dijon, look, we didn't win one match. We went zero for three. Yes. We lost to the same person twice. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, bloodthirsty aerialist was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did, I didn't see any life links sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, we there. weren't we weren't gaining enough life. We I think we didn't really draw was... our, uh, you know. All right, so. The lifelink was gonna come be coming from this Kaya's Guile card, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. I like that's it. That's the only no, one. No, no, we got we got Kaya Orzov Usurper. We've got Vampire Nighthawk uh, gaining okay. life. We got uh, March of uh, Wretched Sorrow gaining life. We, you know, we're gaining life here. But like the problem was, we were just under too much duress. <laughs> to like be gaining life we just had to survive you know Isn't, well, doesn't that just say it all you know it's, yeah well it's because Gurmog kept delving that's why <laughs> you, you just kept delving with your dune worm Fucking that's Gurmog, true man Gurmog. big fish big fish well um, i appreciate you guys this is Steve, the only thanks for coming on this is the only time i'll ever talk to anybody about anything <laughs> Well, you, well, you're welcome anytime, D. If you need to, if you need to air some stuff out, you come, you come right yeah. on Thoughtseize. Yes. Yeah, permanent open seat for you. <laughs> All right. Does anybody in the chat really quickly have any tips on how to get my plateau? Yeah. Any moved? Elden Ring, Elden Ring tips in chat before we look? I played them all, but I'm really plateauing here. He's uh, he's hitting a wall here, chat. And what's your class? What class are you? I'm doing Dex Intelligence build, you know, the classic. Brian says Boulder Farm, Brychamp. Yeah, I'm looking for a farm right now, y'all. Kill bears. Uh, ugh. Miss me with that. What I'm at a, Boulder Farming. Brian. I don't know what Boulder Farm is, but I'm at I'm at the Dragon Barrow. I'm at the, the weird bridge in, in Caleb trying to farm. But if y'all don't know that farm spot. It's just so boring. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> Boulder, whatever boulder farming is, I'm this for three. There's this boulder that you can kill for three thousand runes, apparently. Is it? Um, no. <laughs> like do you want me, we we can we can circle back on that. For yes, you. thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. And immediately go to a side of grace. Oh, it hit me with call that. and show, and then Brian could call. Oh, and in. it respawns. Okay. Oh, so like, yeah. Okay. Brian should be able to call in. Okay, I need to figure out that boulder. I see what you're saying now, Brian. I was like, yo, you want me to go find a boulder for 3,000 rooms? There's a boulder that respawns, apparently. Oh. I like that it says touch grace, because it's like touch, touch grass. grass. Touch you know. grass. Yeah. Um, dive Who's down, cast grace? it. Touch grace is in Elden Ring when you... when you, uh... Sights of grass. Oh my god, yeah. that's amazing. That's, that's a t-shirt right there, touch grace. Touch grace. Mm. Um... All right, D. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate you, fellows. Dijon, thank talk you so soon. much. Well, I'm sorry that the deck didn't work out. Well, I'll talk to you it's all soon. It's our fault. We're going to tune it. It'll be, it'll be great. Hang soon before the tour. Please. See ya. Okay, goodbye. All right, bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we're going to play the end credits now. Oh, shit. I accidentally started a game. Okay. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. <laughs>